completely. Uh, I'm glad to welcome you, uh, Dekko. I have been with the uh, Dekko a number of other kind of public locations. It's the first time I must say that I have the chance and privilege of hearing him speak in public in such an intimate setting. Now, uh, and that is of course privilege, as you know. The greater the English, the fewer the people who need to partake. However, this is not such a lecture, of course. I think that the, the uh, kind of uh, intimate knowledge of those things that we refer to as art, and those people to whom we refer as painter, Picasso, and so on, this kind of work is very rare and growing rare by the moment in the sense that there is that much larger public all the time and that many more candidates for being uh, elected as painting such and not recognized, and yet the knowledge, the intimate knowledge, the first hand knowledge of either the people or the world relatively diminished. And I think that the great uh, merit one of the great and another of uh, various accounts of this work is the how could I say it? The complete knowledge, or as Kofi said, to assert my own individuality to the total knowledge of the tradition. And I think that kind of uh, perspective is so rare and so difficult, and therefore so excellent when it is uh, achieved. So, I'm very happy to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's an honor for me to give this lecture at the AA, whose work I, which work I've known for years and has been very important for very many people of my generation. Um, I'll try to be as short as possible with that kind of generalities, which are nevertheless, I hope, obvious, and if they aren't, it's too bad. Uh, and try to uh, concentrate on the subject. The subject which is more a uh, question than anything very specific, but I've thought, and I believe it's true, that the relation between architecture and art, in short, in the whole century, but in this late years have become more and more close to a certain extent and more and more problematic. There is no contemporary artist who has no relation, positive or negative, to architecture. There is no exhibition that doesn't deal dramatically with architectural problems. There is no art institution that doesn't imply immediately the use of architects. And that is a chance for me to have in front of me present and future architects because I believe there is a certain degree of misunderstandings and misinformations that make most of the time the things difficult when uh, things could be much easier if a certain degree of information, and I call information within that kind of institution like this one here, not just superficial, uh, looking of photographs or reading art magazines or architectural magazines, but uh, something that goes through experience and knowledge also, and that implies a physical uh, relation to things. Uh, so I've decided to, to choose a certain number of artworks. Uh, I believe they somehow uh, relate to questions and to problems, they may be, in a very general way, uh, uh, familiar, let's say, to architects, uh, thinking that that kind of problems are familiar to the artist since very long, and what is to be called contemporary art, if not modern art, has really developed a more very large and very complex protocol of approaching that kind of questions. And I mean 
questions of space, questions of movement, questions of uh, persons or bodies or whatever in space, etc. And I believe these are also questions an architect deals with. On top of that, I would even go further in this kind of uh, approach, of thinking that that kind of problems are not to be considered only as most of the time in close, overprotected, institutionalized space of museum and galleries, and they are to be considered an open space, that means in a speculative way, if you want, in the world, in the most pragmatic way, outdoors or in the city or in any kind of uh, level you can consider uh, problems of space, time, movement and human life. I believe artists have been very efficient in proposing uh, ways of being. They somehow relate to things that in the architectural field uh, mostly are to be found as wishes because the limits of pragmatic reality often uh, don't leave space for architects to develop more personal and more, uh, I would say, peculiar or particular uh, ways of dealing with these kind of problems. In the last uh, 20 or 15 years, uh, many architects thought that this kind of uh, proposing, metaphorically at least, or stylistically, things could somehow solve, if not solve, illustrate the problem. I believe there is a major gap with the arts since contemporary art has somehow excluded, or at least tended to exclude, the metaphors and the illustrations and to come closer and closer to a pragmatic or uh, real, let's say, experiences and not just uh, illustrations. I don't want to go further on, as I told you, in that kind of speculative uh, considerations. I believe most of them are well known. And I will try to uh, enter now the material I brought with me. All the works you are going to see are coming from uh, this exhibition called Documenta that takes place in Germany in the city of Kassel every five years. It was uh, <coughs> in, uh, instituted by an artist, Arnold Boder, who was himself very much interested in architecture, uh, practiced, although though he was not really an architect, architecture himself, especially kind of exhibition installations in the late 40s and 50s, uh, was the determinant uh, uh, defender of modern art in Germany and therefore uh, suffered from the prohibition of all kinds of modern movements in Germany during the Nazi years. Uh, he proposed, he even promised to his wife and to his friends uh, uh, during the years of the war, that if ever the Nazis would go away, he would make in his native city, Kassel, the biggest exhibition that would defend and promote and show uh, what the modern art was. And in order to make it, as he started at the end of the war, he thought it was good to create an institution that would be completely independent from its status and legally from any kind of interference of state interest or uh, political interest or whatever. Uh, it's a long discussion talking about that kind of institution. Since 1955, Documenta found place, was made from out of border and some other people in Germany, in Europe and then in the United States. They've been part of the committee of this exhibition, and the principle is that every five years a new director, a new curator, is nominated by a completely independent group of people relating directly and only to the arts, that the 
quite considerable amount of money, which is the budget of the show, is given with no conditions to uh, uh, association and is completely at the disposition of the people making the show and they have the same risks to take like a private enterprise, though the, the money comes from the state. There are no rules at all, uh, that means you can make a documenta with not one single German artist. There is no notion of representing anything else than what the commission of the people they are selected to make the show considers being the highest uh, point or moment to show art of our time. I was uh, co-curating the Documenta 9 that happened this summer, uh, whose uh, chief curator was a Belgian museum director, Jan Hood. Um, the works you'll see are part of the work we've shown in this documenta. There have been some 196 artists invited from all over the world. I have here only 31, I believe, uh, which is a very small part of the whole group of works. But I've thought somehow to show you work, as I told you, that relates with uh, aspects of things they may interest you more than just very complex uh, issues and context contemporary art uh, develops. Um, another thing to say, and which is very important, I told you a uh, documenta was uh, relating through the interest, of course, of Arnold Border uh, to architecture. In terms of Space, the documenta number one found place in a city that was as much bombed as Dresden. The reason we don't know, the, or we don't talk about the bombing of Kassel, is that it happened during the war. It, was, it happened in 43, and it was a big victory and not a revenge of the Allies against Germany. Uh, when Arnold Border decided to make the first documenta, which is a very interesting point, uh, because many people are talking about political issues and ideological issues which are not necessarily uh, to be found when you look really at the facts. Uh, when Arnold Border decided to make the first documenta, uh, he was in Italy, where in the also bombed Palazzo Reale in Milano, a group of Italian architects in the middle of the ruins, together with the Communist Party in Italy, they've installed the first and major Picasso show made in Italy. The idea in that time was, of course, that a mobile structure, as given by contemporary industry and architecture, would prevent of having to reconstruct uh, steady buildings in order to show art. That means that so, but it could, right in the middle of the ruins, have mobile structures in order to hang and develop the, uh, the work and develop the space. This kind of uh, uh, relation to exhibition and to space has developed, of course, uh, the four first documentas until 1968. Uh, documentas where Arnold Border himself uh, worked very closely to the Putnam show with different groups of people. In 72, uh, Harry Zeman, who has been nominated uh, uh, director of the documenta, decided not to bring an architect. And in the purest conception of uh, attitudes, like in the late 60s and 70s, they just asked the artist to enter the space and to inhabit somehow the space and mark the gestures as it after that, uh, the city of Kassel, with the next curators, they've started reconstructing and restoring the buildings. Architects have been involved in this thing, uh, and uh, originally Yugoslavian architects who 
lived and taught in Castle at that time, Mr. Nikolic reconstructed both the Fredericianum, which is a 18th century building, and the Orangery. When we started working on the Documenta, we've decided to include an architect in the process. The architect is called uh, Paul Robrecht. He is Belgian, living in Ghent. He has uh, worked and studied also in Italy before, in Venice and in Rome. And he, the, one of the major reasons we've decided to work with this architect was not only that uh, we had much of respect about his work, but uh, because he was very close to most of the artists we would like to work with and that he was entering the space with not a specific architectural project, but, but also not with a kind of conventional approach of uh, just uh, uh, proposing kind of interior decoration, but as somebody who will really participate in the debate with the artists and with us. Uh, we've, ended, we've ended up uh, with some buildings temporary pavilions we've constructed uh, just for the show, the temporary, and that was the final uh, result of this collaboration with Paul Robert. I won't show you these photographs, it's a long discussion, uh, it's published in various magazines, you can have information if you want, and my dear Yehuda Safra knows very much about, so he can provide you information. But it is in order to say that the relation to the architecture and to space has become at the same time a very organic part of the show, but also a kind of negative part. Uh, negative in a, let's say, in a positive way, <laughs> or in a philosophical way. We strive at the same time to have architecture and to exclude architecture as something you see as such. And for that, re work, working directly with the artist and somehow trying to recollect in this moment the whole history also of documenta. That means having and the artist being free to move in the space and just mark their signs. And the mobile structure that relates, in to, that relates to major models where we come from and we still be polemically uh, uh, defenders, like modernist, or modern, let's say, uh, propositions in relation to the so-called postmodern things, have made that the relation to architecture, as I told you, uh, became a very complex thing that belongs both to the artist, to the architects, and to the thinkers, and also to the institution. Let me show you the first slide, which is, sorry, <coughs> uh, sorry, I have not asked how it works. Okay. Should I turn the lights on? I think so. This first image you see, there is no art to be seen. This is a staircase uh, made of an architect whose name, unfortunately, I always forget. He is not a known architect, but it's the first building made in the city of Kassel right after the war, not as a quick reconstruction of a bombed city, but as a statement of a modern architect who was not relating to the administration of the city and of Germany. It's a cubic space going up three floors, in fact three and a half floors I would say. Uh, it's all around, it's, it's at the corner of two buildings, uh, like that, and at the corner you have this cubic uh, tower that's outside the building, that goes out to the building, and there's a staircase that uh, relates the three floors and the two buildings together. From the windows you can see the whole city of Kassel, and especially is located 
right at the corner of the central plaza of the city, where right in front you have the historical buildings they serve uh, for the documenta. That's in the site, in uh, deeper side, and on the right side it opens to the gardens and to the, um, the royal gardens and to the edges of the landscape and the city and the urban situation. Uh, from that point of view, you could have a complete over overview of both the uh, city as it relates to the documenta and the documenta itself in all of the different locations the show was spreading around. In this staircase, an American artist whose name is Max Newhouse and who works with sound, sound installations, who happened to be in the very early 60s one of the most important percussionists ever in the contemporary music. I mean, people like Stockhausen and Boulez and Morton Feldman, etc., composed for him, he were the first percussionist to make solo concerts in the Carnegie Hall and to have a solo record of contemporary music and percussions came slowly to the point to abandon performing since he considered that the part of the audience, that the part of the space, were more and more uh, influential in his work, while the attention of the people to the performer was less and less interesting and more and more uh, repetitive. So he decided somehow to abandon his part as a performer and to try to reconstruct and to redesign orally the space uh, somewhere in the edges between visual arts and architecture. And therefore, he is a very problematic figure for most of the well-known categories in museography, but also in, profession, in the professional life. Many works of his are around, some important permanent installations. I believe he is strictly an unknown in, in England. Uh, his work consisted in introducing in the space uh, sound sources, just one per floor. They would mix together uh, and they would mix also, they would help the point of perception for a possible viewer or listener where you could hear through this sound source not the sound itself, I mean not where the sound comes from but the room you, where you are and also the limits, the sound limits of the outside that means when you are in these spaces you hear the rumor and the noise of the city and then this sound makes you hear at the same time the, the resonant space of the room, but also mixes in such a way with the sounds of, uh, from outside that you get the kind of perception of the limit of the inside and outside. On top of it, when going from one level to the other, the change of sound, the slight change of sound, is a Im nearly imperceptible sound, of course, uh, uh, gives you your sense of movement in two different ways, at least two different ways. Uh, one is, of course, going up and down, and the sound is proposed in such a way that it mixes somehow with your movement in, within the resonant case of the staircase, but also it mixes somehow with the kind of feeling you get through the opening of the windows, because, of course, in the first floor, you are in the middle of other buildings. In the second floor, you start having a view of, let's say, kind of from the cityscape. And when you come to the third floor, of course, you have kind of panoramic view, seeing even the river and the landscape, etc. So that kind of opening of the visual field mixes <coughs> with the sound for a very simple reason, which is that even the acoustic of the outside noises is different. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the visual field is translated like an 
mentally or psychologically by the choice of the sound, but the relation between the outside sound and the inside sound implicates the change of scale and the change of space. I mean, it's different, the space of a street, the space of a city, and the space of a very big piece of land, huh, where you get from these windows. So that was a very important work within the exhibition uh, documenta. Uh, it was right in the middle of the exhibition. It was a work that was somehow irradiating all around and implicating the whole show, the history of the city, so many parameters in such a complex way, if you want to think and to talk about, uh, always on a limit that would go really to the point where things could be reversed completely, like the inside-outside, history presence, uh, uh, high and low, whatever, huh? physical and mental processes. But on the other side, it was in such a simple, uh, strictly invisible or nearly invisible or inaudible uh, sign. Huh? So not at all proposing uh, a listing of all these things or an illustration of all these things, but somehow activating the awareness of many possible perspectives that could be opened through physical and mental experience of a viewer in order to relate to so many different uh, fields and perspectives. I'll continue with another work which was right in front. As a matter of fact, you can see here the building where the staircase is inside. It's for very bad photograph, photograph from far away, the outside. Right in front, you have the work of an other artist uh, whose first uh, major presence in the art field was this summer in Kassel. His name is Mo Edoga, comes from Nigeria, and some a decade, approximately more than a decade ago, came to Germany to study medicine. He finished brilliantly medical studies in Mannheim and after becoming assistant at the university clinic and doctor in PhD in medicine and practicing in very highly professional structures, was still frustrated by learning things mechanically and being able to reproduce uh, ways of doing and ways of thinking without being able to incorporate somehow in his thoughts the way his colleagues were doing. He was somehow having troubles in to understand the way his German colleagues were making decisions about things and not just reproducing decisions. That brought him to the point after a lot of uh, uh, research uh, in himself and around him uh, that he was not used in his native uh, language and his native culture to throw away things. And on the contrary, most of the people in Germany he was working with in order to do or to, 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 to understand or to say something, they were leaving out lots and lots of things. In order to understand a little better, uh, he started looking in garbages and going more and more to a place in the city of Mannheim where most of the garbage was uh, collected and tried to see what, uh, what kind of things people used to throw away and uh, trying to understand why. In order to understand why, he started classifying and organizing the garbage and he spent a long, long time of his life in this place just classifying and organizing garbage, starting of course of things they have to be thrown away because they are just they disappeared and whatever would resist to disappearance, uh, whatever was not strictly organic and uh, uh, fail, I would say, degradate, uh, was collected and uh, put together. In his way of putting together things, he started putting the solid things one upon the other, when a few years later found himself 
with a tower in the middle of the, uh, the flu uh, uh, river port, uh, har harbor of Mannheim, a tower of 42 meters high. It was an absolute scandal and shock for the authorities of the city because this tower was built with no authorization and no anything. Hmm? And in the middle of garbage and out of garbage. When the police came, a big and long story, which is an interesting story for architects, I guess, uh, started with the authorities because uh, the Nigerian artist and German uh, doctor in medicine uh, proposed and, and found out I mean, that there is no law in occidental countries prohibiting uh, or regulating the way to put the garbage. There was no law for the city of Mannheim that would permit them to take this thing down because there was no law also saying how you put the garbage and how high you can put the garbage. And of course, he was pretending that this style was not an architecture. No foundation was made. No, no, I mean, there was nothing of the so-called regulated constructive principles was implicated in this work. In the middle of this process, uh, a friend from the art scene uh, told us that this curious and strange person uh, has meanwhile uh, been to meet boys and he was calling himself slowly an artist coming to the point to understand that the reason in occidental societies are, is so important is because we have so much garbage and we don't know what to do with and that is the field for artists they work with. I mean, garbage, I call it metaphorically, of course. All the things, I mean, that was his point, that all the things our, let's say, uh, very well regulated society leaves out of the rules is somehow the field for an artist to operate. And since he was operating out of the rules, uh, he was calling himself an artist very logically. So we invited this artist to come to Kassel. We were absolutely convinced from the strength and the, and, and the, and the intelligence and, and also the sensitivity of the guy, who's really a kind of wise man, been able to argue with the best lawyers and the best and the hardest policemen of the city to be confronted to the most outrageously racist uh, 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 attacks from people uh, with a kind of very serene and clear attitude and we invited him in order to defend his position to, re to start again in Kassel. So right in the middle of the show he started this time to go around and collect in the woods things that were left away from any kind of things. And he started building this tower. You see it here in the middle of the process. Uh, the tower has become nearly twice as big from what you see in that uh, image. Here is already something like eight meters high, it went up to 14 meters high, I believe. And, um, was much uh, wider also. Uh, I come to a simple point. Uh, during the whole process, uh, we were thinking, myself the first, that that kind of approaches, although it's justified perfectly in cultural terms, uh, relates too much to kind of symptomatic attitudes within society in order to be called strictly art, uh, respecting uh, formal processes and awareness of formal definition of work. That was mostly because of the, all the talk around, mostly because of the German uh, mummies going always and ask, but if my son will fall down, uh, are you insured or uh, having old people complaining that it was dangerous and people asking, but does he have a degree of engineering uh, because the tower will fall down and kill people, etc. And the tower was absolutely solid. Finally, I decided one night, because of, uh, Moe Doga was there day and night working in his tower, uh, I decided myself one night to spend uh, lots of time in this tower 
at a moment where the public was not so crowded around, as you can see already there, well, the my dog is with the yellow uh, coat, uh, waterproof, and people are always talking with him the whole time. There were also people talking around. Uh, I decided to go there and to spend a longer time, climb up, uh, read a book, uh, really go in this tower. I was afraid, I must say, at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, but I found very soon that uh, he was right to propose this tower not as a kind of hybrid or, uh, architecture, not as a caricature of a tower, but really as sculpture and as an artwork. The complexity of the structure was as interesting and as uh, decided and as precise as the best 20th century sculpture, I mean, it could be a Brancusi work. Mm -hmm. The notion of material, the notion of physical experience in space, the notion of constructing a space for perception, for uh, uh, in the landscape, in the cityscape, in relation to uh, the whole history of contemporary art was so clearly there, not because the artist did it in a programmatic way, but because his relation to things was a right relation. I mean, a right relation in terms really engaged process of somebody who really looks, puts the highest degree of attention and concentration in what he is doing, knows somehow how to control uh, his or her gestures, and knows exactly what goes on, I mean, which is the very simple principle of doing somehow art. I will stop uh, here. The tower now uh, came down. Uh, it was a deal with the artist, uh, uh, hoping that the tower in Mannheim will remain. It was a tragic thing. <laughs> the day of the last day of the documenta when the plumbers, not the plumbers, sorry, from the, the fire department, and the army came in order to take down the tower. It was really impossible for the soldiers and the fire department just to destruct the thing. And the only thing they could do, and they did it, if not they would need it weeks and weeks and weeks to take it down, was just to cut it, uh, to cut the links downstairs and have it falling with lots of difficulties in order to be destroyed by itself because it was really impossible to break it. It's a very strong thing. So continue with another, sorry, other work. It's a very different work. Uh, I told you that uh, on purpose I've chosen, I mean the whole show was not about towers, <laughs> or staircases, but I've chosen words they relate somehow to things they may also concern more closely architects. <coughs> that is a tower of uh, uh, 18th century uh, at the corner of the Museum Fredericianum, the first building in European history constructed as a museum in the middle of the 18th century from the Prince of Hessen, and the tower was an observatory where major scientists of the 18th century were looking at the sky and starting to build contemporary science. This tower was taken by a German artist whose name is Lothar Baumgarten, also very little known, I'm afraid, in England, uh, who had studied in the 60s with boys and then abandoned or at least left uh, behind uh, the art to work as an anthropologist in South America with uh, Opitz, one major German anthropologist, and he somehow all his life kept this double uh, uh, identity of an anthropologist and an artist. Uh, this work of his is really one of the major arts of our time. This work of his was a very simple way of looking at this tower. The first of all was looking from far away uh, and he just put these flags on top of the tower and gave the title to the tower. The tower is Il Grande Metafisico in Italian and it relates of course to a very well-known painting of De Chirico who of course is called the, grand, the great metaphysician and where of course the tower in the city is what goes out of the level of the city, what somehow is a sublime dimension of the city and what goes out of any kind of leveling or order 
uh, as, of course, a metaphysic point of view. Uh, I'm afraid to say that the more the works are big or complex, the less the photographs are uh, good to show you something, but anyhow. Uh, so if you see the tower from far away, unfortunately you don't see very clearly the flags, there were yellow flags and mostly staying like that and very clearly, uh, would really give you the highest level of the city and this flags, of course, the tendency to go out even of that top level of the city, you know, to mix with the sky and with the movement, etc. Coming closer, uh, you can see that uh, on the right side is a door, porch. Yeah. And he considered, of course, the tower as a function in the city, as a way of going in and out uh, space which is also the definition of a tower, and uh, considered, of course, that from this whole way of going in and out and the very complex protocol that was historically the protocol of entering or going out of the city, what has remained are, of course, the uh, card games. And he just put it the signs of card games on the tower. They come originally from the heraldic, and they are the simplest signs that have remained for, from a very complex language of signs for, from another time. So he just put these signs on the tower. Uh, while coming closer to the tower, he put these words on the tower, because the tower is also a way of showing not only the in and out, but somehow showing the uh, in as, as a social uh, uh, unity, unit, let's say, not unity, a social unit. Mm -hmm. And also it's a place where you somehow show, announce news, uh, represent somehow the city or the power or whatever, or the state, etc., in a city of that time. All the words were found in the press, in television, in any kind of media in Germany after the reunification of Germany. In German language you can just take two different words, put them one next to the other and make a third word. Uh, all the words taken are words made out of two different words. Uh, and the third um, word that comes, which is the word in itself, the composed word, has a meaning that doesn't fit somehow to the composed, composed meaning, meaning of the two other words. And has a meaning that is, for any other language, <coughs> not possible to translate because it's a kind of metaphorical meaning. Uh, there are words, they, are, they come from very old, levels of the language, or they are completely uh, composed by people like technicians or whatever nowadays they make words, they are neologism or very old words, and which meaning is first not possible to translate, and second doesn't comes out of a kind of addition. That of course was a way of proposing, of course, the unification of Germany as a linguistic uh, or, or problem, as a problem of meaning, let's say. No? So that was uh, proposing a kind of unity uh, that is very problematic no? and that you cannot translate, you cannot analyze very clearly, which uh, where each part comes from a different story and the meaning that comes out of the two parts is a meaning that doesn't relate anymore to these two parts. No? That was the work of Lothar Baumgarten in the city. So it was a very different approach of an existing thing with existing things added and re-articulating the social space. That is a work of a Russian artist, Ilya Kabakov. Uh, in the courtyard of the palace, uh, of the museum, he built these public toilets uh, there are toilets like you can find in a caserne or in the country, 
they build it very quickly, like they do in the country, with no architect and no engineering and nothing, just with the material you can see. That was a photograph made the day they were finishing the construction. And when the thing was ready, they just removed these things you see around and it was staying there as you see it. I mean, no, no, nothing more than something you'd find in the country. Men and ladies for the toilets. Men and ladies for the toilets. And when you would enter the space, it was a very different feeling to be found. It was completely inhabited by a very large family, including grandfather, grandmother, the couple, and most probably many and different children. Uh, going indistinctly from the men's to the ladies' uh, department and articulating a complete housing, including the most incredible details of everyday life. It's easy to take it as a metaphor, and as a matter of fact, when we first enter the space, after Ilya Kabakov has worked uh, secluded in the space alone in order to really inhabit and put all the things around, display the things around. We enter, strange enough, uh, by coincidence, uh, with another young Russian artist and uh, an Irish artist, a Cuban artist, a Sicilian artist, and myself coming from Greece. When we entered, the first reaction was of the young the younger Russian artist who said, oh my God, it's exactly like in the Soviet Union, the ex-Soviet Union. People in Russia, they don't have where to live. Have you seen this misery? And Kabakov was making like that. And then suddenly the Cuban said, you know, in Cuba it's like that. Also. And uh, the Sicilian said, but I don't think it's a political problem. You know, in Sicily, all the houses are like that. And then the Irish said, but in Ireland also, and I must say that in Greece, in every country house, the poor people have exactly the same kind of objects, the same kind of uh, uh, organization of the space, etc. The only thing is, of course, that these toilets are not to be seen. But who cares about the toilet? When you are, you are in the space, what you see suddenly, they are not the toilets. It's really the quantity, the density of, 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 of life, each single object articulate as a living space. And suddenly, the toilet could be anything. Uh, could be a, a closet or whatever. As a matter of fact, you call it water closet. Huh? Uh, you forget it completely. You see people's life. And as a matter of fact, it was also not a theatrical, it was not a theatrical set uh, it was proposed because the artist himself, for more than one year, was going from flea market to flea market all over Europe in order to collect precisely every item that was exposed in this space. And it was not at all kind of metaphorical use of objects, but really things he have somehow seen and he has recollected as they were also thrown away. I mean, what do you find in flea markets? Huh? Things, people, they just live out of their life. Huh? And he retook, he took them in a very similar way, in a, in a way like the African artist who built the tower. Huh? Let's continue. An Italian artist, Michelangelo Pistoletto, did a very different work, but also very complex. Right on the other side of the Museum Fredericiano uh, is the, the small street with old houses. Most of the houses have one or two floors. And right in front of the door of the museum, there is the number nine, a small house with on the ground floor uh, store, and on the first floor uh, the house. We've rented this house facing the, the exhibition, and Michelangelo Pistoletto, during one year, he worked in this space, uh, after having shocked everybody at the beginning, saying that uh, he will build some 30, if not more, walls in this space, and when we said, what do you mean by building walls? He said, each wall will be a moment in the space. It will be a way of going through the space. And we said, my God, it will cost a fortune to be so complicated. And how will we take down the walls? And I said, no, the walls are mental. They're not necessarily to be built. But I have really to measure 
every week and every month the possible movements and try to find where this movement stick together and create a kind of line in space that's a line, a line of life. After entering this place and starting sleeping in the store and coming with his family and looking around, etc., slowly, I mean, he was putting on the wall uh, every time he was entering and staying, the dates, etc. It's still there. After a certain point, he found what for him was really the way to do, and he did this work, which is a very simple work, not at all 30 walls, but really uh, the lines. He built it a piece of Roman street, right in the entrance of, from the door, that blocks the door, you cannot close the door. Uh, the street, which is outside, becomes inside a piece of antique street, but of course, this piece of a thick street, when you are inside, you have to climb up, of course. It becomes also kind of like a table or like something, another, like a pedestal uh, that articulates the space in a very different way. You will see it in the next slide. And this uh, Roman street, strangely enough, comes to the same level like the second space behind, where you see a Roman statue of an orator holding a mirror that is as big as the wall, and where in the mirror you see reflected all the space behind you, that means the plaza, the street, the plaza, and the facade of the museum. It's a very clear uh, passage in time, in historical time. The more you go in the space, the more the perspective to the outer space, into the historical space, becomes bigger. Uh, on the other side, of course, a kind of threat is to be seen also, because this Roman statue that holds with a hand like that, the mirror, if somehow could have turned side and look at the people and not anymore the wall, not anymore the mirror showing what behind us, but just face the moment, would become somehow a Nazi uh, gesture in Germany, and that would mean also that the mirror would fall down because it was not fixed and break. It means it won't be possible to look back and to understand anymore and to recognize where do you come from, where history is somehow. Right? That is one line from the street to the fourth back wall of the, of, the, of the space, when on the other side you just see on first uh, space here, the, the, the Roman street as it is, a kind of bed or chair with on the wall a self-portrait made out of his father. What you see in this thing hanging on the wall is the artist himself, Michelangelo Pistoletto, six months old, in a drawing made of his father. So he shows himself as his father uh, drawed him as a young baby, as a baby. On the other side, unfortunately I don't have a photography, the slides here, uh, just a small table and a chair with a TV monitor, with a video uh, uh, in it, was proposing a portrait of the artist made with his daughter. His daughter, which is an opera singer in contemporary music, and made a performance the very first days of the opening and of the, of the exhibition, the very about first week. The album. Yes, about here, like the table here, of course. Mm -hmm. So the performance consisted of something very simple. She was just sitting exactly on that table in the space, eating a risotto, just rice, singing at the same time while uh, she was reading the newspaper. And of course, the what she was singing was the text of the newspaper, the news, somehow what you read in the newspaper, uh, in the most complicated and complex uh, operatic contemporary virtuoso art, uh, with the mouth, of course, full of rice, at the same time so absorbing food, proposing news, and also, I mean, reacting to what happens, and of course, at the same time, uh, singing, having pleasure, having fun, and making possible for us also to have pleasure and fun, and a certain ironic 
distance that was of such a generosity and such a, a right temper that was really one of the most uh, precisely uh, ironic pieces I've seen for long. After the first weeks, the video uh, was producing the performance in the TV monitor, so he was having also the confrontation of the painting that has become a copy, and so bigger, because the small drawing of his father was like that, so it's uh, become bigger for photography, and the daughter that has become also uh, uh, a video image. Mm -hmm. So kind of passage through the materiality also of reproduction and of media. Mm -hmm. The whole work was having the title uh, Tartaruga, Progetto della Tartaruga Felice, the project of the happy turtle, and of course the means for the happy turtle was the way of going slowly, a little bit in time, like the turtle, and not rush like the rabbit in the uh, story. And the project went on for a whole year. Behind the mirror, on, on the right side, when you enter finally the room and the back with the mirror, a last thing were to be seen, an empty bed in an empty space, setting space for a guest, a friend, or somebody who could enter the space, being not directly related to any of these two axes, not the private, not the public, but somehow setting a kind of uh, lateral or oblique space for a person which is in and out of these lines. So yes. In the backyard of the uh, Federiziano, an Austrian artist, Franz West, did this sculptural ensemble, this group of couches, as a sculpture. I'll show you another. You can see it from the front side. They were just couches made by with fer forge, with uh, iron structures, with cartons and uh, uh, the most cheap and easy materials you can find, and covered with rugs, used old rugs collected from Rome to Vienna, from Prague to Paris, etc. Rugs you also throw away, so rugs with no real uh, value, but all good drugs, but they've been used and thrown away. The work was uh, functioning at night as an auditorium where, I mean, you can see the screen on your right, uh, on the right of the screen here. <coughs> so you, in, at night there were, it was used as an open-air cinema where every night or every second night films of other artists and video projections, etc., were to be seen, while during the whole day the space was used by people to sit and talk and uh, have in all kinds of encounters, rests, and somehow be in a certain kind of space, which is, of course, the moving, the movable space, the temporary space, the space of sitting and laying down and just having a rest. And so it's quite a very interesting work. It's, of course, a work you can very hardly see in a photography. First of all, the rugs were much more colorful from what you see in this uh, photograph. And second, uh, there were also many layers of meaning. They were immediately perceptible for a viewer. One, of course, uh, the rugs, the oriental, I mean, the all images coming from oriental uh, 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 nomadic life, but also the very present notion of homeless people also, kind of structure where people, they don't have a home. And as a matter of fact, many nights, many young students coming with not much money to visit Documenta, instead of going to the hotel, they just spent the night in <laughs> these mansions. And uh, uh, also, the couch of Sigmund Freud is not to be forgotten in the list of possible associations. 
a Cherokee Indian, Jimmy Durham, did a work of which, unfortunately, I will show you only one image. It's such a complex work, implying so many different small objects and spread it all around, uh, that it's very difficult to show it. But in the middle of a lot of completely uh, uncomprehensible things, where all kinds of different cultural cliches were meeting, but in a very tiny, fragmentary way, uh, and spread it around from the inner space to the outer space. To the, uh, an animal was supposed to be the one that who gives the, the pathway and the definition of space. An animal that would go out from the palace and go down to the river to drink water. And following the steps of this animal, in the middle of all kinds of cultural hybrids, came to the point where you start seeing the river from far away, and you have these two stones uh, right in front of you, which are, uh, with this small sign, this small text on, uh, as you see, they seem they are one stone cut it in two. If you look at the shape, yeah. And it is not. There are two stones coming from two very different places. They are the same kind of stone, but found in two different places. The one is a stone coming from a ruin of the royal palace next to the museum. So a stone cut it in the 18th century and found uh, simply there, in the ruins of the ex-royal palace, that was bombed and disappeared. And the other came directly from the quarries in the mountain, where they still cut these red stones for construction of the castle. And it was just right in the middle, just before that the animal came to the river, uh, these two stones, looking like one stone cut into two, and there were just one coming from the mountain and the other from the building. A French artist, Jean-Marc Bustamont, did this uh, work which consisted in just putting three plates of uh, brass in, on the surface in, 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 the, in the small, uh, how you call it, the fountain where water is the same level with the surface of the water. That's also work that's different to, difficult to see in a reproduction. Uh, the work, of course, consists in proposing lots of different ways of perceiving things. Uh, the surfaces are constantly mixing. You can think or you can see, let's say, the surface as metal or as water. You can see all kinds of different reflections because in moments you see the outside reality, in moments you can, in different moments you cannot see. I mean, going around eh, and in different moments of the day and different points in space, you see it as pure shiny gold. You see it as uh, muddy and uh, 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 dark uh, water. You see it as uh, metal. You see it as construction or as liquid. You see it as three parts or as an inner movement in the water, etc., etc. Very complex work that fortunately will be now shown in the south of France in the court of the Museum of Nîmes, because it's a very interesting way of relating to space with nearly doing nothing but just asking to the viewer just to have a much more complex perception. I mean, I must say that uh, what is very interesting in that kind of work, in this work, is that the principle, it's not a sculptural or constructive principle, but merely a painterly principle. Transforming a perception of a natural thing, like a, like a fountain, in such a complex thing, like an impressionistic painting could be, it's not, not an easy thing, and include so many different points of view of a very simple material 
thing. It's something that it's interesting in itself, and I believe it's interesting for architects also in order to see how many things you can see in a very simple thing, just a piece of metal or something, within a real space. That's another work of the same artist in the inside space, which is a piece of glass, uh, long some four meters per nearly three to something, uh, which was cut, it looks like a leaf, like an organic form, but the form came out uh, not of a drawing that was abstractly designing or, or figuratively, sorry, designing any kind of motive, but by measuring how far he could enter this piece of glass in cutting it without breaking it. That means all the ways of entering and cur uh, uh, carving and making curves in getting this piece of glass. If you would go, let's say, one centimeter deeper here, yeah. the glass, for instance, will break immediately in three parts. So it's a piece of matter that holds in a very big tension and that is also somehow floating in the space because it's that high from the floor uh, and is in uh, sta uh, holds in uh, some 16 uh, pieces of, of uh, so big things they are like the things you put a piano on huh? this felt things or culture thing you put a piano on. So it's uh, really uh, concentrating the biggest physical resistance in an image, of course, that is all uh, shine and uh, I would even say fascination and illusion and whatever you can think of, that kind of very vain, uh, metaphysically vain things. Per Kierkegaard, I'm afraid I'm, being, uh, I'm only in the beginning, so I will soon stop with the images because I think it will be interesting to talk about a few things. Per Kierkegaard is another artist who has also a direct relation to architecture, although he's not an architect. He worked a lot with sculpture and painting, and he constructs that kind of uh, things with bricks. They are, of course, pure architectural practice, but not made as architecture, made as sculpture. Uh, Kirkeby, uh, at the same time he worked and he studied, uh, he was trained as an artist, he was working also as a geologist. And uh, being a highly professional and serious scientist, working with major expeditions in the North Pole and in Greenland and South America, etc., and geological, inquiries. Uh, he was doing his drawings and trying to understand the space. Uh, and of course, two things are always very present in his work from the very early 60s, where he starts to work till now. The one is the idea of a passage, like a hole you go through, and which is asymmetrical in relation to experience. That means uh, it's the, the two sides, the two parts of this passage are not the same. It's not like opening a door, opening a door, going from one room to the other. It's like being outside and looking inside, or being inside and not be able to look outside. And it's a way of condensing a lot of things in this passageway. And the other is, of course, that uh, any kind of materiality comes from different uh, cultural origins and it, or lines, let's say, interpretive lines, and is to be understood as such, and uh, not to be mixed. Therefore, uh, I can show you immediately the following image, which is, which consists of small models in bronze of things they are made in full scale, as you saw on the other side, and of course they have nothing to do with any approach of an architect of a model. They are real uh, sculptures where there the bronze and the tone etc. 
relate mostly to the hand of the, of the, of the, of the, of the artist than to the uh, uh, project itself. And mostly they are made after or during, but rarely before. They are not projects, they are a way to work in a scale and in a different kind of relation to things, the same kind of space as a personal uh, relation to something and not as a uh, way of proposing something that can be reproduced bigger or can be understood as, uh, as a project. The uh, big construction you see here is the one of the very uh, strange constructions Kierkegaard has made. Uh, he started with uh, constructions were completely closed, and this one is a very clear passage. And although it is passage, somehow the height of the of the building uh, is such that you never have the feeling you go through, because whenever you go through a door like here, yeah. you find yourself in a space that is so strongly related to yourself and suddenly you have to stop, you are in the middle of the construction and suddenly this space opens on the side and as you see it's the first, second and third space so this space is open on the other side completely like the second space is open on that side so suddenly you find yourself in a completely different feeling than the feeling going through what you have when you before entering where you have the three doors going one after the other this image of the opening of the three doors is completely interrupted when you enter the first space because suddenly the opening on your left is so big I mean big because it's very high and you have a kind of clear vertical cut in space on your left side where the outside is as important as the inside and you are at the same time not inside and not outside and that is repeated three times of course uh, through this building in such a way that one of the most difficult things to do and I know very few people they uh, would ever think of doing it I've looked myself people going through during the hundred days of the show and even after is that I've known nearly nobody coming from here inside so from outside going here and going right and left huh? you kind of come to this or straight line of three doors and every time you are completely out of the space and vertically and not at all in the line of the horizontal cuts like would be the architectural plan that is uh, here to be let me see what comes after yes uh, sorry that is the work I think I will uh, take as an end of this discussion. Unfortunately, I have another 40 or 30 images in the carousel, but it goes too slowly to continue. Uh, that is a work of a Japanese artist called Tadashi Kawamata. Kawamata was a kind of very young artist, he's not even 40, he's in his late 30s, I believe. Works for very long also with uh, wood that is found in the cities. He came to Kassel, we invited him, and he makes always works that they are never permanent and never really temporary. Because the contract with the artist is you never take the work down, you make, uh, when you like, you make a kind of contract with the artist, how long the term, the, the work can stay there. And if you would like to leave it forever, it cannot because it will disintegrate. So somehow there is a kind of discussion with the artist how long the work will stay. Uh, it includes so a kind of time principle in the procedure of thinking and doing the work. And it includes the time principle also in a different way since the work, the work is not transportable you cannot bring it for being from somewhere, the artist has to do it there, I mean it's site-specific work and of course what makes the work uh, even more complex for a site-specific work and very particular in relation to other procedures we know from other artists is that the artist of course uh, before making the work or during the making of the work has to 
go all around the city. I mean, you have to provide him somehow a van or a small car or whatever, where he can collect all the wood. He go to all the industrial places, everything, collect, uh, left away, put away wood that is to be thrown away. And with this wood, which is a very different kind of wood, the one uh, a dogger used, this is mostly boxes and things in industrial wood, uh, he creates uh, not necessarily the same kind of images. They are works, they look completely abstract, and dynamic movements of wood, but they somehow they relate to this kind of simple principle of putting pieces of wood and then articulating wood around or through this, uh, I would call, uh, columns or whatever it is. And uh, here he constructed a whole village. Here you see only perhaps not even a fifth of the whole site <coughs> down in the small river in the park. He constructed a, a whole village that looks a little bit like a favelas, like to this kind of small uh, groups of houses in Spain or in South America, etc. There are houses you can enter. They're very provisory structures. They are made in the most quick, fast, and uh, easy way. They are though solid enough. We were very surprised to see that while a big tempest where the water of the river came up here, uh, the houses stayed there, never go, went away. Very solidly made. Uh, although they were made by three people, the artist himself, a young student of the art school who helped him, and a homeless person, a kind of clochard of the city of Castle, who were very happy to work with and mm -hmm. take him to find all the wood. And uh, it's a very interesting work. I believe the way to approach it is a very complex way. Uh, the ambiguous feeling you get through this construction which is on one side a very happy moment. It um, brings you in front of, let's say, uh, feelings of high elegance, uh, reminiscences of uh, fairy tales or of children, dreams and stories when you see it from far away, like being in another world, etc. And of course, a kind of very clear frustration of the same kind of feeling which is also given by, the, of course, the choice of the landscape, how he enters the landscape, which is a very important thing, really a major part of the work also. And of course, a certain degree of frustration and of uh, uh, pain, I would say, uh, in front of, let's say, the condition of misery, which is also included, without making any statement keeping this ambiguous feeling constantly on the edge, on the rope, uh, never coming to a conclusion of a kind of univocous meaning, and of course staying in the landscape in a most precise, most minimal, uh, and uh, I, okay, sorry for the word minimal, it's over, uh, used in the art scene, I don't mean it formally, the most tiny, let's say, uh, uh, level of, of course, implicating all kinds of uh, bipolarities, like nature, culture, uh, you can see even the wood itself, which is around, being tree and cut wood, industrial construct, construction and garbage, etc., etc., in a very simple, very light uh, way of reactivating constantly this contradiction. 
I'll stop with this work and with the last image where I don't have to say much, if not that during the whole process of uh, preparing documenta, uh, many critics, journalists, colleagues, museum directors, etc., were constantly asking what's the concept of documenta now. And after considering all possible things we could have used as a context, as a concept, we came to the point that it was really impossible to just find a label. If we really wanted to keep this complexity uh, of not having to choose, to choose just formal principle or just uh, one level for proposing something. And we came to the point that uh, in order to understand what art is, you better need works than words. Not that the words are excluded, but if you need words, you need much more than one word. I would say, in that sense, it's such a good thing that dictionaries exist, where you can find thousands of words, if not all the words, then you can talk about. But it's very improbable by isolating one word, or even two or three, together to build a concept that can, at least today, not idealistically, but precisely, I'd say, in related to experience, that could uh, take uh, part and could uh, include already the, let me tell you, the, six, the 15 slides I've shown to you till now which are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine artists. Now, already for these works, it would be impossible, and only for these nine artists, to find just one concept that would be sufficient to talk about. And when you have 196, and they are all as good and all as equally uh, gifted, and you have to give them equally the chances to develop. Uh, all dimension, and when you put all these dimensions together, it was really impossible to find a word. Perhaps the word God would be in the medieval times a possible word, but it doesn't work anymore. You know. So we've looked in the past, or in the near past, close to the present, and we found some artworks. They somehow, in a very simple way, was showing what we couldn't say. The image you have is a sculpture of Giacometti made in 1947, called the Noble. You can see in this very simple thing, simply at least a certain amount of contradictions, a certain amount of things that have been all the time till now considered in the discussion. You have all kinds of relation to space. You have the cage with the inner space and out of the cage with the outer space, in the most simple way. Then you have the head that's floating in space and holding how through a certain degree of gravity, but also through a certain degree of going out of uh, a proper principle of being there. So somehow we have a way of going from one space to another. You have the passage, the kind of dynamic of going from inside to outside. If you separate uh, formally or the two spaces, suddenly you have just one thing. I mean, if you take out the thing, and you cannot say that you know it. Not that you know that you know it. You have to. And if you cut out what comes out, you can still have a head and a nose, and somehow they are continuous and interrupted at the same time. Huh? And I can continue to talk about this work. I believe you can do that kind of work in your heads for yourself. Uh, uh, it seems obvious how many things you can see in a work like that. And that is a work that, become, that has become somehow part of a common heritage of good taste, culture, 
uh, artistic interest. I mean, nobody will claim nowadays that Giacometti is a scandalous thing for art lovers. I mean, even the most conservative people would somehow consider that Giacometti is perhaps one of the smoothest and nicest contemporary artists you can like, even if you don't like contemporary art, which is, of course, a very superficial way of seeing the things, because if you really look at this work very carefully, it's a work that still resists all kinds of taste and all kinds of leveling cultural processes propose. In that sense, it's a good concept. It's like taking a concept in philosophy, for instance, from Kant and being able to still be revolutionary with something that belongs in the history of philosophy on one side, but on the other side you can still talk about. Huh? So this work was, of course, a work that gave us somehow the means between four curators, an architect and 196 artists, among other works, to negotiate somehow uh, space, movement, work, impressions, subjective and very personal things, and also a kind of historical level where things have to be reconsidered and redefined every day. Thank you very much. I would like to say the last word, since we've had to interrupt, things are always interrupted, and in order to thank you also and to say how precious it is to be here and to talk with you, it's just a very simple notice that the works you have seen tonight, the nine artists, were the so-called outdoor works. There is uh, much more work that was being done inside, in inner spaces. What for me was very important, and you see it very clearly in these outdoor works, is that you have the constitution of a very complex uh, density of space, uh, and that was the same inside or outside. A space that somehow relates to constructive principles, but is constantly informed and reformed by uh, let's say, experience, hmm? life, time. But at the end, the concept of space that is somehow the principle of the work becomes a density of time. Hmm? And uh, to say that perhaps on that level, if there is a difference, a superficial, sociological and uh, stupid difference to make, not 
abstractly with architecture in general, but what I would call architecture in the most trivial way, what you see mostly around, what people do, is that, of course, life and time are mostly taken within very conventional for granted, for granted and very conventional definitions. And what is very interesting, I hope and I believe, for architects to see in that kind of constructive principles of work is how, of course, the density of time uh, going through experiences, they are not the so-called uh, constant embarrassment of architects uh, in front of a client who wants to put the kitchen on the right instead of the left and this window a little closer to the bathroom, uh, which it's not that kind of relation to a person or to a person's life, but also with, within a certain degree of speculation, with protocols and codes, they go much further than any anecdotal approach of life and uh, experience. And they are, of course, a very precious collection of knowledge and experience articulated within something that I wouldn't call a system, but I would call definitely a, a, a deposit or a re re reservoir, what knowledge has become nowadays, where you can, of course, find other kinds of uh, possibilities to work with and not just cut the time in a previous part of something to be thought abstractly and then make it in a certain moment and then give it to some people they have to start from the beginning and find out how the, they can inhabit. And the meaning of the, let's say, philosophical term inhabited space uh, with an artwork considered not in classical metaphysics as an abstract process of just something happening in the <coughs> sky or in genius terms, as was the kind of talk you find in Romantic, in German Romanticism, but going really through experience of space, experience of life, experience of processes that can go till mathematical and scientific processes they enter and they inform the experience. Uh, I was entering with Mario Metz, whose work is to be seen in this uh, beautiful show at the Hayworth, and I would invite you to go and see uh, the work, the, uh, this uh, exhibition, Gravity and Grace at the Hayworth. You have works, they are condensations of space and time, of experience and knowledge, as units of life and of being. And that is, I believe, something that misses most of the time, architecture in general, not that there are not architects they know about, and it becomes quite difficult to include in architectural principle. While on the other side, I'm afraid to say that artists become better and better informed, not only abstractly about architecture, but they can deal with and include architecture very clearly in the processes. So if there is a dialogue to be continued, I would really think that architects should consider a little more deeply, a little more uh, uh, structurally what an artwork is, and not just continue to think that it's just an ornament or a cultural thing or a stylistic effect or heritage or whatever, that is just a formal or a social principle. That is what I wanted to say in order to end this discussion, which is only a part of a very large discussion that I hope in another time and another space we'll have the opportunity again to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you.